I actually don't know the steps that government took to try and turn the tide. I know only of the president putting his uh, presidency online and uh, calling in the military. Did he lie to us? Uh, well, um, I know his conscience will be disturbing him now, okay? Uh, because uh, I think he underestimated the challenge. What we have in Ghana is despondency. Uh, people are losing hope in the future of the country. And so we have young men and women who are aware of the risk involved in illegal mining, yet they defy everything to put their lives at that risk. It tells us something as leaders. That's an indictment on our leadership. They shouldn't, these young people shouldn't be doing that. And yet, they have no alternative. So is that so that? Mm. It is not for you to, to order military to shoot and kill, as some of them stated, any person involved in risking his or her life to survive. It's not right. It's not right. We got it wrong right from the beginning. Because as you are aware, the term Galamsi came from Gada and Sel. And that was done by who? The ordinary citizens. When we decided to commercialize the activity, to industrialize it, we gave it to big time foreign companies. We did not develop the industry ourselves. And those companies came and exploited all our resources to the benefit of the metropolitan West and to the abject poverty of we, the owners of the resources. How much is this now, a threat to us, especially going oh into no, the 2024 serious. general election? Because I hear you bring in the bit about unemployment. The last time I checked, it was over 14%. Yes, it is over 14%. And I think that even if we get the figures right, it will be more than the 14 percent. Because some of the people that are talking about are underemployment, you know, but they count them as being employed. We need, we need to do something quickly. We need to assure these young people and all those involved that there's something better than they are doing, so opt for that thing. Ahead of 2024? We need to give them incredible process, a future that they can look up to and to agree to move away. Because after restoring the, the, the environmental damage, it's expensive, but we can do it. Okay? That is what the well is about. It can regenerate. But we need to give them an alternative. How is this a threat now as we speak? Serious threat. Four, mom, four months to the country's general election. Serious threat. Most, most of those people definitely uh, will not buy what the politicians are saying now. Because they've heard it many times. And as they said, the failure of His Excellency Nana Adodankwa has given almost fatal blow to the trust of Ghanaians in the democratic process. But so many people believed in him that he was going to make a difference. Unfortunately, he has disappointed all of them. Even on the level even, of economy? Even, yes. Even his followers in his own party really don't believe in him again. I describe him as a, a, a lame duck. And uh, he wasn't happy with that description. Why but did you describe him that, that way? That is a statement of fact. Why did you describe him that None way? None of his party members is looking up to him for leadership. And authority has moved from his hand. And they are looking for where to position it now. So most of what he's doing, his people are not in support. So what you're saying is that even with the explanation of COVID-19 pandemic and the, the Russia-Ukraine war, which is still raging, you do not think that the government has been able to handle the economy much or well? That those things you mentioned, 
were they only things meant to affect Ghana? What about the other countries? Are they in this state? What about the Ukraine itself or the Russia? Those warring factions. What is the state of their economy there? So what is our problem? It's leadership. That is the problem of Africa. It's leadership. And our definition of leadership is different from the others. And so we keep on making mistakes because we only listen to those who are in the position to deceive us and cajole us to believe in them. We don't even take a step backwards to analyze where they came from. Why don't we? Well, it's basically because of lack of information. The fact that we've not been able to educate ourselves. When I talk about education, I'm not talking about formal education, read and write. No. Even informal education in the family, we've not been able to imbibe the values that build integrity. Not just integrity in the person, like honesty, but also in our systems. And so we rather glorify, we glorify uh, people who have developed skills to defraud, cheat, and deceive us. Those are the people we glorify. And so any person that wants to come out to face the blood and tell the truth is scandalized, destroyed, and nobody comes to the defense of the person. Mm. And so the others, I mean, you definitely you are intimidated. So what you're saying is we love evil more than good in this country. Exactly, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. You just mentioned leadership. And on Tuesday, when that conversation about illegal mining came up, you said something, and I'm going to quote you here, that if we take a census, some of you, referring to MPs, will be there. Why do you say that? Because they are involved. You know for a fact that a number we, of we, we Please, even when we talked about this, uh, uh, there were some fraudulent uh, micro uh, finance companies that came out some time ago. <laughs> These MPs were involved. And some of them used those resources to contest to come to parliament. And they are again involved. Couldn't you have done in anything about it? I wasn't even there. I didn't know it until some investigations were conducted. And I got to know it. Did okay. you do anything after? As a speaker? The Speaker of Parliament. What, what At least do? the members of Parliament are, quote unquote, under your leadership. No, 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 no. If you look at the legal framework governing the functions and the role of Speaker, I cannot go that far, you understand? I've tried these four years to try and handle the balance. Many people don't know the difference between this parliament and all the other parliaments. Tell us. That's very different, very, very different. We had a plurality or majoritarian system before this parliament. And therefore, decision taking was very easy. You had the numbers, you put the question, and the majority had it. This time around, there is no majority party in parliament. We have complete hung parliament. Not only in the numbers, but also in the gender. You understand? The ladies, 20, 20. And all making 137, 137. Do you think... With one gentleman being independent. Now, how do we take decision? And so most of the time, I have to create the opportunity for us to sit down to dialogue to agree on daily basis the agenda we're going to execute for that day. And how do we do it? We agree every morning before I come to preside. But during the course of it, yes, the leaders are leading people. And so when the people disagree, the leaders cannot continue to sacrifice their lives. So sometimes they have to listen to the people. So things change on the floor. And that's why sometimes I say I'm taken by surprise, okay? And we have to go back. So it became difficult for us to take decisions. 
It's also good for us because we've now been able to hold the government on a number of issues. Oh, so this near-hand parliament, as you used to uh, refer to it, is actually good for us. Has it helped us? It has, and I will always preach that we need to be having it from time to time, if not continuously, because we need to build the institution of parliament. This democracy hangs on the strength of the institution of parliament. If parliament had been up and doing, this country will not be in this debt or in this mess. Because the structure that we have in our constitution, in spite of all the powers of appointment that have been given to the president, is in parliament. And parliament can hold the president really to account. When the president refuses to answer the call of parliament, if the state institutions see themselves as not government institutions, they will play their role by supporting parliament to implement the law. We talk about rule of law. We not talk about rule by law. What's they are the not difference? the same. We need another uh, opportunity to discuss that. And so parliament has to be empowered. Almost of the issues people raise is because they've not delved deeper into it. The fact that as a member of parliament, you are given a position as a minister of state, doesn't take away your role as a member of parliament to even criticize your own government. I did. I didn't find favor with some of my colleagues, but clearly they are happy I did. Certainly, because you were able to stay in parliament <laughs> for almost 30 years. Exactly. And that's why from time to time they even call upon me to take some of this responsibility. So it's not bad to do what is good. You understand? And we need to carry this culture on. And no president can run over parliament. The system that we have. And when I started raising it, I made challenges. Because the system that we have, you need only two thirds votes of the members of parliament to do what? Impeach a president. If you have to remove the speaker, you need three quarters which makes it more difficult to remove a speaker. And what I was simply doing was fighting to make sure that we strengthen the institution of parliament. I didn't sell my conscience to enrich myself. And that's one of the issues I want to stress. When we talk about prosperity, when we talk about greatness, when we talk about the growth or development, we're talking about the community, the country, we say America is rich. We don't say the Americans are rich. But in Ghana, in Africa, we are translated to the individual. And so the individuals try to aggrandize. And they become rich, but the country becomes poor and the majority well in poverty. So what you're saying that, is that although, okay, I want you to finish on your thoughts, that. That is what we must learn. Because I see people use the word prosperity and they say, talk about individuals. All of you who have visited America, you know that the people are not rich, but they have a system in place that takes care of their uh, priorities and make life worth living. But they don't have cash. They don't have property. But there's a place for them to lay their head comfortably and to give up their best until they go back to where we all came from. So, so it's very important we get that sense of building the country, the nation Ghana, not ourselves. So I hear you say we need to empower parliament. I hear you also say that it is not bad to do what is good. And the reason you're calling for the empowerment of parliament is so parliament will be able, as one of the third arms, one of the three arms of government, will be able to hold the government accountable. And you are also saying, if I heard you correctly, that although you were selected from an opposition party, as the speaker for a hung parliament, you've tried your best to ensure that you're balancing the equation, even sometimes against the party that nominated you. That's what you're saying. Truly, and they all know it. And my colleagues in Parliament, they know it. Both majority and minority. Without my intervention on many occasions, 
Nothing from government will pass through. Parliament. Did you ever hear that they said sometimes you were tilting too much towards the governing MPP? How did that make you feel if you ever heard that? Well, I just take it that it's ignorance. Because they don't, they don't understand, they don't appreciate the situation we are in. And so most of the time, if the speaker decides to go by just the numbers, on a daily basis, you see the National Democratic Congress is always in majority on the floor. On a daily basis. And if you have to take decision, then you see our colleagues trying to buy time to be able to call their members to come. If the speaker decides to push ahead and put the question, they will definitely lose. And at the last sitting, not this recall, you saw how they voted out the IDA facility of $250 million. Mm. They didn't have the numbers. This recall, there are a number of issues they could not take because they didn't have the numbers. The NDC members were at all times more than them. So this recall and eventually was irrelevant we, because they couldn't achieve what they wanted. Well, we had, because of the national interest, to rescind the earlier decision and now approve the IDA facility of 250 million for the country in order to keep at least our economy afloat. But I hear you also say that you've been able to handle this hung parliament well. That's what you're saying. Posterity will judge. And I can assure you there are records to show that what I have done, please, is worth commendable. Is there a state capture in Ghana as being uh, uh, mentioned by some minority members of parliament? Well, let me, let me say that Ghanaians generally are very good people and they know what value is, what is right and what is wrong. And they know how to reward and commend people. And for this period, as you recall, uh, a number of traditional areas have called and honored me with some titles. So I am Na, I'm Nana, I'm Togbe, you know. Which one would you want us to they, refer you to? Well, I'm all. You know? as, as a speaker, you present everybody. And, and that is what I've been doing for these years. I think that the people who talked about state capture have tried to produce evidence to support that. And there's strong evidence on the ground that there is really a process to have a complete state capture. Do you believe those documents? I have read some, and there's no reason why I don't believe in what I have read. And I have visited some of the areas, and I've seen there's enough evidence that there's strong state capture. And we really need to take action against some. There are some other areas that I disagree with those who talk about the state capture, and some of the examples that they've mentioned. And so I often call them and try to discuss with them and to produce evidence to show that this is rather in the interest of the country. And I've done it a number of times to my friends, particularly the members of parliament who appear on TV, radio, to talk about these things. But there's strong evidence that they state capture. How has this affected us, our current state? Well, the risk is very high. Um, our democracy is decaying, and we're getting back to autocracy, and we need to work together to turn things around. And some of us are there, we are prepared to support, not lead at this position as a speaker. I will not risk the honor and value of the position to go contesting to be president of Ghana. No. You start from your party level, and primary, pri primaries, if you lose, you devalued your position as speaker. That's why you don't see any speaker <laughs> attempting. So you will never attempt it? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is enough honor. And there is enough opportunity to serve our people. You know? And I, I treasure that opportunity. And I'm extremely grateful to Ghanaians for this opportunity. We are a beloved country, loved by many. In fact, we are the mecca of the black race. They see Ghana as a place to go. All black people all over the world. 
and so forth. They want to see us really be the black star of Africa. Unfortunately, we now nose diving and people are disappointed. Would you say so that we need to do a lot? Mm, would you say that the sale of uh, some Senate hotels could be one of the reasons you're convinced that there's state capture? Actually, it's, it's, it looks like in the lexicon of some people, uh, conflict of interest doesn't exist. When, when you decide to serve the people, it means you're taking away yourself from serving yourself because there will be conflict of interest. And so when you decide to come into politics to serve the people, you have to move away from being a business person to serve your interest. So it was wrong. So it's, it's very wrong. If we decide, if really institutions were working, some of these things, it calls on the uh, Ghana Revenue Authority, the National Security, the other investigating bodies to probe further into the source of money. For, from those people. So this also talks about how you we know, are managing our, 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 our funds as a country. Well, <laughs> you know, that, that is the waterloo of our development. You know, you have individuals that are richer than the country. And you now have people dealing with safe heavens in islands. But the most hypocritical aspect of it is the international community. What do you mean? Well, those stolen funds and this, and actually, they know where they are. Are they supporting us to bring it? In the case of Nigeria, they struggle to get them to release the money. They have developed instruments where you can now save money not in your name, but in numbers. What does that mean? At the end of your life, nobody can trace that money. So would you then say... That, mm. that is thing that people who call themselves educators should know. As I said, I don't have any account outside Ghana. Why? I don't have. Why? I love my country. I save in Ghana. That is it. Was, is the National no. Cathedral project necessary? Well, it was a pledge by His Excellency the President to God when he visited the Wailing War. Uh, my evidence is that His Excellency visited the Wheeling Wall three times. And that was one of the pledges. But it was a personal pledge. It was a personal pledge by him. So it shouldn't be a national so, project? No, it shouldn't be a national project. It was a personal pledge. If I became president, I will construct a cathedral in honor of you, my lord. Right, Honorable Speaker, I want to ask you my last two questions and they will wrap up this conversation. Uh, num the first one is... So I would ask you two questions in one. Why Parliament is retrofitting at a cost of 2.26 million euros? The process to retrofit the Chamber of Parliament started long ago. And the seventh Parliament, through its Parliamentary Service Board, processed the tender to award the contract to a company. Long ago, do you remember when exactly, please? Oh, it was done 2019-2020. I became speaker in 2021. Indeed. And so when I took over, we saw that the situation was getting worse. And on many occasions, the systems broke down. So parliament couldn't function. And so we had to process it, trying to look at the best way of doing it. And reassessed it. And by the time we went to award the contract, that is, re-award the contract, the equipment had been upgraded. But the chamber could not function without this equipment. And so even you realize sometimes we had lights off. The lights off is not from the national, but from the system inside. Sometimes we are not hearing each other. And as speaker, where I sit, I really struggle to hear what the members say. Without the microphones? Without the microphones. Even with the microphones, there's always some interruptions. And particularly when some members are trying to whisper, you know, 
Sometimes they come out loudly and interrupt whatever happens. But the speaker should be on top. You must be all ears. And you have to sit for those period of time, usually four hours continuously, listening, understanding, and guiding the house. And from time to time, giving rulings. And you have to have a system to be able to transmit all this to you and for you to respond to the situation. And that was breaking down. So we had no alternative than to do that, particularly as we are getting to the end of this parliament and there will be a new parliament. Everybody witnessed what happened when I was being elected. It's because we had to do things manually. And so the system that we have now will allow electronic voting. That actually reminds me, why didn't you do anything about it? Because it was a clear invasion of parliament by the military. It was actually a coup d'etat. But I am a party. How impartial will I be in handling something that dealt with me? It's unlike the US one, where the Senate were being asked to validate election results. And Trump and his people came to attack the Senate. That's different. This had to do with members of parliament who were struggling to elect. They were now presiding. And after that, he got the deputies sworn in. And now, these are actions that breached the law. So the law in foreign institutions should be those that should come in to investigate and prosecute. Not parliament itself that will be self-serving, where the same members of parliament who were involved will now be formed into a committee to investigate themselves and to bring a report to the person they were struggling to elect to preside and take action against people. That, in my humble opinion, I thought was the conflict of interest. Are you for the bill introducing sirens and special treatment for MPs on the road? There's no such bill. There's no such bill. They have been an instrument meant to amend the existing road traffic regulations. And that was being discussed outside parliament at the formative stage. It hadn't yet come to parliament when the issue broke out. But the reason that the members made those proposals were based on the fact that the other arms and state institutions were being given that opportunity, but not parliament. So you are for it? I, I am if not for it. it. Okay. I'm not for it. At this state, that the facility should be available in the system for everybody. When there's emergency, then you call on the police to lead you. It should not be open to everybody. But it's not also right to let it be like it's a property of the president. Only the president can use the siren and also uh, ambulances and the rest. So no. you're looking for fairness. That's what I get. Fairness. Why should the IGP use the siren and not the chief justice, not the speaker? Like what happened during the time of the demise of our former president. And we had to rush to swear in the vice as constitutionally demanded. We should be caught somewhere and we don't have that facility. So that facility should be available for all. That even in your situation, if there's an emergency, you should be able to call for that facility to lead you to the nearest facility, uh, uh, health facility. You understand? But it's not good to discriminate and restrict it to some people. We keep on glorifying and giving power, absolute power, to an individual. And that is not democracy. Right. That was what we discussed recently when they now brought the instrument to parliament yesterday. And people were talking about people being bold and speaking the truth and letting Ghanaians understand what the situation is, not misinforming people.